He that loveth not knows not God. For God is love. That's what I want to focus on. For God is love. And this manifests the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world. That we might live through him. That we might live through him. I want to look for a moment at love. Love to many people will mean many different things. We'll have many different emotions attached to it. We'll think of it in many ways. Love is certainly an emotion, a powerful emotion that can give us a sense of gratitude. A a sense of gratifying and uplifting our hearts and and make us feel all warm and lovey-dovey inside. Ever have them moments? Yes. Can make you smile. It can make you have a burst of joy and emotion. It can make you want to hug somebody. Uh, Particularly, you know, you can have a moment of absolute love and, you know, you're over over the moon and you want to hug a stranger. Any has ever been that far gone? Yep. Some people hug trees because they love trees and but love can have us all sorts of emotions. Love can bring you to a place where, where we read of people that cry with tears of joy. Love is an incredible emotion. Love knows no bounds. It has no boundaries. It unifies, it can unify, it should unify. It helps heal broken relationships. It heals broken hearts. Love is the thing that can dry those tears. Love is what unites people. Love is what unites a man and a woman in marriage. Love is what keeps them together. Love is incredible. Powerful emotion. Love is something that should be and is incredible and good. But friend, to bring a balance, we must also look at the other side where people's perspective and, 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 and thinking of love is so twisted and so distorted because of negative experience, negative emotions, negative things that have happened in their lives. Love to somebody can be, unfortunately, someone who's been abused. And, and, and out of abuse, someone perpetrator could say that it was the emotion of love that drove them. And whilst we know that that is not the truth, It is something that they have twisted, they have taken. Love to somebody could be, unfortunately, that their parents have hammered them or beat them after night after night and and, and, and so beat them so much. And it's a story I've heard often, they have so beat them. And yet they are the ones that are supposed to love them. Love is twisted. Love can be when a man batters his partner time after time and bruises her and beats her. Story I heard last week of a of a woman that was just so beat, and yet and yet her partner would go back to her and say to you, "But I love you." It's twisted. It's not of God, but yet it's their experience of love. To the teenager or the person that has been abused or raped and our perpetrator says it is a love. It's twisted. It's crazy. It's, it, and folks, there has to be a balance. And when we say that in people's minds, some people don't know what love is. It's so, so miscued, so tainted in their minds. Love is, and again, I've heard the story often when someone is left at an orphanage or a doorstep. Just left. Love is. When a mom leaves a baby at a hospital and runs. And that child grows up never to know. Or is never to understand what is love. What is it? And the reason I establish the highs and the low of that is for this reason. Our love at best. Is mediocre. Our love at best is high in the middle and in the lows. And there's sometimes we say to people, 
Do you know what? I really just don't like you. And then there's other times. Do you know what? They're the best things since sliced bread. I love you. You ever see that? And particularly anybody, we see it in Teen Challenge, is on the love drug. I love you. Lee, I love you. And then the next day, Lee, I really don't like you. <laughs> Ecstasy has changed it all. Love at our best is something that is ebbs and flows. And yet we come and we look at the words of love. And I'm going to look at three types. First one is filio. It is a love that is one to another. It is, it, it is an affectionate love. It is a love between parents and children. It is a love uh, that, that, that is reciprocated one to another. And it's so strong. And it is strong. It is an incredible bond to it. But ye, yet even in this type of love, this love can still be put to the test, can still be pressurized, and can still be fractured. And how many times have we seen families fall apart? How many times have we seen brothers and sisters fall apart? How many times have we seen uh, family units fall apart? Because it is a love that can still be fractured, yet so strong, yet so deep, it can and still crumble. We come to another love. This one's called the Eros love. Simple terms in the Latin is just erotica. It's another word for physical love. It is more of an emotion than it is a love, but, but it's a love, it's something that is necessary. And let me explain that. For all of us in here that are married, that, that are in a relationship, that uh, have a boyfriend, girlfriend, etc., let, me, let us all be honest and say this. The first time that you asked your wife or your husband or whoever out on a date, the thought in your mind wasn't, she may make a good cook. <laughs> right or wrong? The thought in your mind was, that's a good bit of eye candy. <laughs> Come on, someone be honest with me. And, 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 and ladies, the first thought in your mind Hmm, he looks all right. He's not so bad looking. And that is, a, that is the eros love. That is the love that initially just brings you together. And so we, we don't come and think of what she may be in the future. We, we act immediately upon an instinct that moves us and makes you make that phone call. Here, love, would you mind going out with me? No. That didn't go too well, did it? And I often say this, and funny, my wife was, was telling my oldest boy the other week, the first time that I phoned her and asked her out, she said no. That was far enough. I phoned her best mate and I asked her out. She said yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but it wasn't after her best mate. You know, and that wasn't right. But anyhow, the reality of it was, that's what happened. And uh, I, was trying to, I was trying to make a point. I was trying to say there, you nearly missed the boat. <laughs> but anyhow, we, we got together. And, and so it was that instinct of, of asking her out. And, and when I say that, what I don't want you to misinterpret that for is lust. It's not lust. We're not talking about lust. We're talking about that, just that moment of time when you... Look at someone and you go, yes, you need that. Call it chemistry, call it whatever you want. Zero's love, it's, it's a love that we need. And, and so it's that that brings us to that physical attraction or, or that attraction and, and brings us in it. It's that that causes us to continue the relationship and to continue going out and dating and romancing and all that good stuff. And then we finally get to the part when you're sitting over dinner. And you just look at each other eyeball to eyeball. And you know what's coming. I love you. Oh, I love you. And you get all nervous. And you get all shaky. And you go to lift a glass of water or whatever you're drinking or juicing. Then you have to set it back down because now your emotions are really coming out. Who's been there? Three honest people in the room. Come on. 
when we get to that point and we get to that place where we come to and we plug up the courage and in this modern day technology it then moves into you text all through the night to three o'clock in the morning to four o'clock and I love you and then you probably send we hearts and hearts and arrows or whatever you call them and uh, and that's the way it is emojis and then we come to what I believe the Bible terms is the greatest love of all calls it agape and this love simply means a love that's sacrifice sacrificial it looks for nothing in return it is a love that means for you to give up of yourself, to seek nothing back, to seek nothing in return. Absolutely unconditional. There's no strings attached to it. There's nothing you're looking in return to it. It is totally unconditional. And we come to the Word of God, and the Word of God tells us in Corinthians, that though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, I just become like sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, as though I could move mountains, but I have not love. He says, I am nothing. I'm nothing. And he says, and although I may give all of my goods to feed the poor, and although I may give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long. And here's now the difference of biblical love. Love suffers long. Love is kind. Hallelujah. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't flaunt itself. Love is not puffed up. It doesn't be behave itself unseemingly. It doesn't seek its own glory. Love is not easily provoked. And love thinks no evil. Rejoice is not an iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And love endures all things. Love is just more than an emotion. Paul was saying and writing this, not because he was part of a happy movement, like in the 60s, when it was all love and peace, but was because he was full of the love of God. He was so full of the love of God, and the why was he full of the love of God? Was because he was full of Christ. He was full of him. He was full of Christ, and Paul knew the very heart of Christ. He knew him intimately, he knew him well, and because he knew Christ, he could write these things. He could write about love. He could write about it without shame. He could write about it for how it was. And he knew the essence of God. And he knew that God is love. He knew that he was more than an emotion. He knew that it was his being, that it was who he is. He knew that Christ emanated love. And he knew that, he, that, that Christ was everything that, that captured love. He knew it. He had more than just knowledge. You see, knowledge is one thing. You got to get the experience. When you go from knowledge to experience, it changes all things. And I said this to someone the other night, I could tell you that radiator is roasting hot. And you know what? You'll believe me. And you'll say, do you know what? I believe you, Lee. I absolutely believe you that that radiator is roasting hot. And you've no reason to doubt me. I tell the truth. You've no reason to doubt me. Knowledge is not enough. Do you know what you've got to do? You've got to go and touch it. And then your knowledge goes now from knowledge to experience. You know that it's hot. And have you ever heard that we say in the Christian faith? I know that I know that I know. Who's heard that? You see, I know that I know that I know. Paul just didn't have the knowledge of love. He knew. He knew him. And when you know him, and when you have the knowledge of him, he knew him because God is love. John says, 
we have known and believed the love of God that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says this, follow after love. How do you do that? How is that possible? How can you follow after love? Is that a movement? No. Follow after love is a person. Love is a person. It's a person of Christ. And he says, follow after love. Follow him. Jesus said to the disciples, follow me. Follow me. Follow after love. Is it a thing to be chased? It's a person to be followed, to be chased, to be loved. And so, friends, tonight I say to you, follow after Jesus Christ. You want to know true love? You want to know love that breaks all boundaries? You want to know love that can reach your heart more than any relationship? It's Jesus Christ. He's the author of it. He's the founder of it. He's the one who is it. Ephesians tells us and says, husbands, love your wives. Any husbands in here, we ought to love your wives. As Christ, listen, loved the church and gave himself for it. He loves you. You that is in here tonight, he loves you. He loves you. He gave himself for it. He was talking about that sacrificial love. A love where he laid down his life. A love where he gave his life. A love where he says, I will lay down my life because I love the church. And who is the church? The people. It's not buildings. And although we term this church, it's not buildings. It's people. It's people. And he died for you. And he loves you. He's saying of a husband, yes, lay down your life if necessary for the sacrifice and the gains of his wife. But he brings in the thing and he says, but as Christ loved the church, he laid down his life. Why? That we might live. The love of God. Then he goes further. I think this is incredible. That he might present it to himself. Listen, a glorious church. Do you know that Christ wants to present you glorious? And you may not feel glorious. You may not think to yourself, I'm not glorious. But listen, he thinks you're glorious. He thinks you're wonderful. He thinks you're incredible. He says that he may present himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but he might, and he should be a holy and it should be without blemish. He's saying tonight, because I died for the church, you can be holy and without blemish, and I think you're glorious. And I don't know, friends, if you've, you've ever been married or not or, or in a relationship, but have you ever wrote a love letter to your wife or husband, boyfriend or girlfriend? Any has ever done that? Yes. There's a few. You're going to have to get more honest. Because I don't believe half of you. We've all wrote letters. We've all wrote a text. We've all wrote those words. And this is like a love letter. I love you. And I died for you. And I laid down my life for you. I love you. I love you. And not only that. One day I'm going to present you to myself glorious. All your faults. All your failures. Because we've all got them. I don't care about them. If he had occurred about them, he would never have came. I love you. Friend, he loves you. He loves you. The Bible talks about a woman that is brought, caught in adultery. Dragged through the village or the town. Ridiculed and naked. Dragged by a mob of men who professed to be the leaders of their day. 
and drag her to the feet of Jesus and say to him, she's caught an adulterer, stoner. They wanted blood that day. They wanted a woman to be put to death. They wanted a woman to die in public. The Bible says that Jesus went down. And he begins to write. We don't know what he writes. He begins to write. And he says, he that is without sin, cast the first stone. And everybody, one by one, they walked away. Because they all had sin. Every single one of them. And then Jesus gets up. He says to her, where's your accusers? Where are they? They're all gone. And the one that could have condemned her, the one that had every right, they could have stoned her, says to her, go and sin no more. Folks, what happened? Someone tell me what happened. The love of God went into action. He loved her. Do you know that woman would never ever have forgot that act of mercy or love again in her life? And there's one thing about a, the love of God. There's one thing about an act of love. You never forget it. Yes, I know we can remember our, the wrongs. I know we can remember the things that people have done on us. I know we can remember the people that have hurt us. I, I know that. But we will never forget an act of love, an act of sacrifice, an act when somebody goes above and beyond. And you know what? We're grateful. She will never have forgot the love of Christ that day. Who was this man? Who was he? Who was he? Do you know what the Bible says? Him who is forgiven much loves much. When Christ shows you an act of kindness, you will never forget it. In the ministry of God and in the work of God, we often see crisis, we see broken lives, we see things that seem impossible to fix. Lives that have been devastated by sin. Lives that have been devastated by circumstances, by traumas, by drugs, by alcohol, by whatever, by prostitution. We've seen it all. I'll never forget being in New York, walking in the streets of Brooklyn, and they were handing out flyers. And on the flyer, it simply said on the front of it, how much do you think you're worth? And that is a question everybody ought to ask. How much do you think you're worth? I'm not asking you to put a pound sign on it. I'm simply asking you, what do you think you're worth? Some of you will have high value of yourself, little value of yourself, medium value of yourself. And so the question simply asks, how much do you think you're worth? And, and as, as they were giving out leaflets in Brooklyn, they were walking down the streets. A couple of street girls uh, had taken the leaflets and one of them just began to laugh and mock and make fun of. And said, how much do you think I'm worth? And started laughing and joking. And then when she opened the flyer, it was a wee one that you opened. She's seen in the flyer, you are worth it. You are worth the death of God's son. She stopped in her tracks. She turned around. She says, am I really worth that? Am I really worth that? The guy said here, you are. And there and then on the street, she gave her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He changed her. And he made her new. He gave her a new heart and he loved her. You see, an act of love. Was it, was it the fact a street worker changed her heart? No! It's the love of Christ that arrested her. It changed her in a moment of time. A moment of time. Love is more than an emotion. It is the heart of God. The Bible says that this is the love of God, that it was demonstrated that Christ died for us. You see, I often say this, love has to be demonstrated. It's okay to say I love you. It's easy. It's easy to say to people, oh, I love you. It's easy. It's easy. Love has to have an action. Love has to be demonstrated. 
Love has to move. Love has to have a driving force. And so the Bible says that God demonstrated his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was an action with it. There was a moving with it. There was a power with it. And so we come to the place. Maybe you say to yourself tonight, does God or can God really love me? I don't know what you're going through. I don't, I don't have a clue. I don't know. And I'm not going to pretend to put your life together because I can't. But I believe God can reach into your heart. And I believe God can change your heart. And I believe the love of God can be shed abroad in your heart. And I believe God can give you a new nature. And I believe God can give you a new life. I believe that. And I don't even believe that I've seen that. I go beyond knowledge. I've seen it. And so I even say tonight, Christian, have you captured the love of God? Because if you haven't captured, if you're doing nothing as a Christian, you do not have the love of God in your heart. Because the love of God has to have a driving force behind it. You cannot say you love him. And do nothing for him. And when I say do nothing for him, I mean, what are you doing for others? Because he came for the church. He came for people. And our whole driving force should be to win others. Church, to win others. To win others. To rescue them. To help them. To encourage them. To lift them up. To rescue them. To be the hands and feet of God. That we may go to the broken. Go to the needy. Go to those that are desperately hurting. And say to them. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He can do something with your life. And so love has to have a driving force. We cannot have the love of God. And sit back Christian. And do absolutely nothing. While the world goes by. And dying. There's a city out there. There's a community out there that is totally lost. And you know what they need? They don't need money in their bank. They don't, win, they don't need to win the lottery. They need Jesus. They need to know the love of God. And I know we need money to pay the bills and put food on the table. I also believe God can look after that side of things. People need to know about Jesus Christ. He loves them. And there's no point in judging them. There's no point in saying, but they're into this sin and they're into that sin. So what? Who cares? Christ died for them. Ah, oh, they're on drugs. So what? You want to categorize sin? Go ahead. You'll miss the heart of God. I don't care what you're into. What I care is, are you desperate? You're desperate for him. 